This video will be an introduction to motors and specifically stepper motors. Next week we'll get into some other motors and how to do some speed control using pulse width modulation. So motors rely upon the principles of electromagnetism and they use that to give rise to electromagnetic fields and forces that will cause parts to rotate um, using the torque and then that will in turn cause loads to rotate or to move depending upon what mechanical attachments you may have to the motor. So hopefully you remember from physics that there is a relationship between the force, the current, and the electromagnetic field that you may have. And so the force is equal to the cross product of the current vector and the field vector. So you're going to see this force vector coming out perpendicular to wherever the field and the current happen to intersect. And so when you have a current and it's going through a wire within the presence of a magnetic field, that could be an electromagnetic field, it could be a field created by a fixed magnet, then a force is produced. So you probably remember from physics or some of your other engineering classes that there is a right hand rule when you're taking a cross product. So if you were to pretend your current vector was your index finger and your force vector is going to be your thumb coming out, then your field vector is going to be your middle finger coming down there. And so the force is going to be perpendicular to the current and the field. The current and the field are also going to be perpendicular to one another. So that will help you to understand what direction your force is going to be applied when you have a current going through a motor in the presence of an electromagnetic field. So electromagnetism, as we know, the forces there will intensify if you increase the current. That is the current flowing through the motor and it will also intensify if you have more windings around a coil. So the number of windings on a coil, number of windings on a motor helps you to know um, just how intense that electromagnetic field is going to be. So typically we use laminated iron to uh, serve as the core for motors and then you're going to have some wire that is going to be wound around that. The reason they use iron is that it does allow for a lot of permeability of electromagnetic flux. So let's look inside a motor and see what is happening here. This housing is called the stator here, and then inside you've got the commutator. The commutator is what's going to spin around. Typically your stator is going to be fixed, and you've got a north and a south pole. And so depending upon your attraction and repulsion to the north and south pole, you are going to give rise to circular motion around the central axis here. And so what you see here is that you have this north to north. Remember that opposites attract and like repel. So this is going to be a repelling relationship, north repelling north. And this is going to give rise to torque over here. There's going to be an attraction over here from north to south. So that's going to bring that over to there. And then generally what happens is you go ahead and you reverse the field and then that gets you to keep going and rotating on through. So your north becomes south, your south becomes north, and you change that using the electrical signal that is on this electromagnet on the commutator. So there are a lot of different motor types and it's important to understand some of the benefits of the different ones. Um, in your field as an electrical engineer you may be responsible for choosing different motors. So I want you to understand what those properties are. First of all, you need to choose whether you want an AC or a DC motor, and that really depends upon your application. So AC motors typically are used in applications where something is fixed. Uh, it may be plugged into a wall. It may just be on a, a component that's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to be attached to the wall. DC motors often are in portable systems, so those could be mobile robotics or anything that happens to move around and need to attach to a battery. Some of the types of uh, motors you may see, servos, you've probably already experienced those in some of your freshman classes, they tend to be fairly high speed. And so if they are standard servos, you can send in a pulse width modulated signal and drive them to a specific position 
Some of you may remember using those with the ping sensors in your freshman uh, design course. And you can also, with a continuous servo, drive them at a particular speed using a pulse width modulated signal. Stepper motors, which is what we're going to learn about in class this week, have very precise motion. So those are often used if you need to get to a very specific position, such as uh, driving the print head for a laser printer or an inkjet printer, just to put things in very specific positions. You may also see them used in things like robotic surgery applications where you need to put something very precisely. Some motors require very little current, some require very high current. It really just depends upon how much torque you need to apply and uh, how fast you need some things to go. So some are very low torque and some are very high torque. It just depends upon your application. So if you're thinking about turning a turret on a tank like you might see at the bottom, then you may need a very different motor than what you might need if you're trying to move just an ink tank across a page to put an ink dot um, for printing a picture. Stepper motors are nice because they use very little current. They also can have very high torque at low speeds. They're generally not terribly good for high speed applications, but they are good because they can be very precise. So they're good for printers. They're also good if you're trying to do some manufacturing. Let's say you had a conveyor that needed to move a part to a very specific position where something else was applied to it or you had some kind of a special laser cutter or water jet cutter and you needed it to cut at a very specific location. Back in the day when people used floppy drives those were very good for uh, positioning the media inside or if you have traditional hard drives with platters that turn or uh, the reed head needs to turn those are very good for that. They're also good if you're trying to do manufacturing operations that involve milling or turning things on a lathe, you want to turn them very precisely to make sure you're getting the exact cut. Sewing machines where you want to make sure those stitches go in exactly the right place and aren't overshot. Stepper motors are great for all of those applications. So let's look at how stepper motors work. As you see on your screen, there's a little bit of an animation. Inside, you've got a gear with some teeth and then you've got some electromagnetic coils surrounding inside of your housing and you're going to activate those different electromagnets and that's going to cause attraction between the teeth on your gear and some of the teeth that are extending from those electromagnets and as you change where the attraction comes you're going to have these teeth that are out of alignment come into alignment and you're just going to keep rotating that pattern constantly through. In some cases you may be activating just one electromagnet. In other cases, you may have a very specific pattern and you're activating two electromagnets at any given time within your stepper motor. And there always is a set pattern. And so if you see a stepper motor, you typically see different color wires extending from it. And if you read the data sheet for it, you can learn about what that set pattern is in order to operate that motor. This is the schematic for the stepper motor port on your QL200 trainer kit that we've been using in class. The stepper motor actually will plug in, there's a little white socket off on the right hand side just before the breadboard. And so you have a six pin header on the stepper motors we will use in class. In order to use those, you will want to turn on the switches that are connected to RA0 through 3. We haven't turned those on previously because we've been using RA0 through RA3 for other things such as our seven segment display or LCD, um, maybe some of the LEDs, we've used them for a variety of other things. But in this lab, we're not gonna be using them for any display, we're going to be using them to control our stepper motor. So here you happen to see um, you've got this connection and this is where you will connect up your motor. And so you've got some of these jumper headers if you want to look at the signal that is coming in, you can use that to monitor things on the oscilloscope, but the motor will actually be connected over here. And so you're sending a very low current signal, um, just coming out of your pick, those are very low current signals. And then you've got here some transistors. So hopefully you recognize that these are field effect transistors and they are being activated by sending a signal through here. 
you're activating them to cause a connection and then that is making sure that your motor is turned on. Your diodes down here are just ensuring that current is going in the proper direction. They are also good in there for when you happen to turn off um, the motor because motors are effectively inductors and inductors do not like to instantaneously change current so those diodes serve as flyback diodes to effectively allow that current to dissipate um, without damaging your motor. So that is the stepper motor circuit and just know that all you need to do is really change a set pattern on port A on the three pins that we have there and that will get your stepper motor to move. So here's a little bit about how to program the stepper motor. You're going to use RA0 through RA3 so you'll need to make sure in your Tris A register those four pins are set as outputs and then you see before you the four patterns that need to run in a row. So you'll have uh, 9, C, 6, and 3. And if you look at how those are, what you're effectively doing are moving 1's and zeros, and you're activating two of the electromagnets inside of there at any given time, and you're not activating two, and you're just moving that on through. And so if you have that pattern in order over and over and over again, that will give rise to clockwise motion. If you want counterclockwise or anticlockwise motion, you simply reverse the pattern. And so it all depends upon which direction you want your motor to turn. In some cases you may want it to go clockwise, in some cases counterclockwise. If you're thinking about uh, a scanner or a printer or something like that, in some cases you want that print head to go left to right, in some cases you want it to go right to left, so it would be very typical for you to want to reverse that pattern on a regular basis. So here's the basic steps. You output the first pattern, you delay, and that delay gives time for that motor to move into that position. Then you output the next pattern, delay, and keep doing that. And if you repeat that over and over again, then you will see fairly smooth circular motion. The precision of the stepper motors that we will be using in this class are not terribly good. So we're going to be using stepper motors that for each increment turn 7.5 degrees. Really good stepper motors used in industry, something you might want to use say for a dot matrix printer or a laser printer, inkjet printer, would typically have a precision of less than one degree per step. But for our applications this will help you understand a little bit about how those motors work. So in order to turn you have to recognize that one pattern will move that motor seven and a half degrees. So if you cycle through all four patterns, that will give you a total of 30 degrees. And in order to do one full 360 degree revolution, you need to go through all four patterns a total of 12 times. So if you go through 12 times, you'll make one complete circular loop. And so depending upon how long you want things to run for, you can uh, get it to go more times or fewer times around. So, the schematic, we talked a little bit about the use of field effect transistors. They are effectively allowing us to meet the current requirements for our motors. So, the PIC itself is not very good at outputting high current. Those transistors help us to amplify the current so that we can run a particular motor. In next week's lab, you're actually going to be using some higher current DC motors and we're going to be interfacing with an external chip called an H-bridge and you're going to put that on your uh, breadboard in your trainer kit. But for this week we're not going to need an external circuit. Those transistors happen to already be built in. But next week be prepared. We're going to be working on interfacing with an external chip and you will be building up a motor driver circuit.